Hey you guys, it's Peter and I'm back and I am very nervous to make this video today. This is my very first true crime video um, that I am making with no uh, background story to the story that I'm going to be talking about today, which is about Mara Murray. Um, so if you guys didn't watch my last few videos where I talked about true crime, I came out and I talked about my history with serial killer Herb Baumeister. Um, and that video got so many comments on there where people were just saying like, oh, I love this, Peter. Do more true crime. Do more true crime. Peter, I love you doing true crime. This was such a great video. And I just want to thank you guys so much for the encouragement and the positive comments that I got on that video. <clears throat> I have been intrigued with the Herb Baumeister case since it was going on, way back in the day, around the time that I got sober. Um, I've just been absolutely intrigued with that case, and I want you guys to know um, that there will be updates coming uh, with that video, or with that uh, story. There will be updates that are coming on that as well. People are asking me, like, oh my god. I was kind of surprised, and I said this in my last video when I announced that I was going to be doing some true crime over here. Um, I said that uh, people were like acting like they were scared watching the video, which kind of surprised me, in all honesty. But I have to tell you, uh, as somebody that is an avid watcher of true crime documentaries, when I know that um, something that I'm interested in or a story that intrigues me, I get very, very scared. And so that was a compliment in, in a way. And I just want to say I appreciate so much those of you that uh, watched that video and those of you that are on the journey for me doing some true crime videos over here as well. And if you didn't watch my last video where I announced it, um, it's the video previous to this, what I said was that I'm going to start doing some true crime over here from time to time. Maybe one to two videos a week once I get into it regularly. For those of you, and I know that there are a lot of you out there that are not interested in true crime, I will be doing influencer drama as well. Just so you know, I will be uh, talking about content creators, YouTubers, Instagrammers, TikTokers over here as well. That's not going anywhere. There may be days where I post a true crime video and a drama video. So I just want to make that very, very clear. Um, I also want to explain to you kind of where my start is going to be with doing true crime because I really thought about this deeply this weekend. I thought about, is this really the, the next move that I want to make on this channel? A lot of people were speculating that I was going to start another channel. I have seven channels. I don't need to start another channel. The true crime can go over here. I think it's a good fit. Um, and I actually reached out to quite a few people for different reasons, but one of the people that I talked to this weekend was a very dear friend of mine who has just had my back and just always checks in on me and um, has, has been there for me through and through way before her channel, way, way when her channel was very, very small and now it's huge and that is Emily Baker. And Emily Baker is a dear, dear friend of mine. I am a law nerd. And um, so she and I talked this weekend and about all kinds of things and just caught up and whatever. But anyway, um, Towards the end of the conversation, I, I, I wanted to ask her two questions specifically about, like, you know, doing true crime because she covers a lot of stuff like that. And she's, you know, covered extensively the Murdoch murder. She's covered extensively uh, the Gabby Petito case and things like that. And so I knew that she was somebody that would be good to ask about doing this. And the first thing I said to her was... Um, I said, do you think that this is a good evolution for my channel? And she was kind of silent for a second, and she said, let me ask you this. She said, are you passionate about it? And I said, I love true crime. Like, I'm obsessed with true crime. And then she said, then you need to do it. And it was just that solid answer. And whenever I talk to Emily, she always just gives me very solid answers. She's one of the most compassionate people that I know. And she's just always been there for me. And I just want to say thank you, Emily. I love you dearly. Um, and then the second thing I asked her was, I said, that I don't really know how to find stories to talk about. You know, like I watch a lot of documentaries. I also have a true crime book club that I run with my good friend Mel. And, um, you know, we read past cases, current cases and things like that. And I said, I don't really know how to find cases that people are interested in. And she said, just ask your audience. And I said, well, I did ask my audience. And it was flooded with comments about John JonBenet Ramsey and all these old cases, right? And she said, well, then that's apparently what your audience wants to hear about. So I thought about it this weekend, and um, I thought about how to approach this channel. Um, I am mostly interested in cases that are unsolved. I am mostly interested in cases that are ongoing investigations or cold cases. Those are the cases that I'm the most interested in. Therefore, those will be the cases that I am going to be talking about. 
I don't talk about anything on this channel unless I'm interested in it. So that's going to go with true crime as well. Um, the John Bonet Ramsey case is actually a case that I have been obsessed with for years upon years, ever since it very first happened. And for those of you that don't know, I have a long history going way back to when I was a kid with my mom of um, watching pageants and loving pageants and things like that. So when the John Bonet Ramsey case happened, um, it was something that I was instantly, immediately intrigued with. Not to mention that my mom's best friend, my Aunt Susie, lives very close to where it occurred in Colorado. Um, and so this has been a case that I have followed closely for years and years and years. That video will be coming. But I didn't want to just dive in and just like pick some cold case out of the blue. And um, in fact, I actually, I had watched this documentary um, called, they called him Mostly Harmless. And it's it just came out and um, it's about a hitchhiker that they found <clears throat> that had passed away on the Appalachian Trail. And um, so I watched that, and it's a lot about, like, citizen detectives, internet sleuths, and things like that. And so I watched it, and in there, they mention the group of the uh, one of the people that is finding out a lot of information. And this weekend, I went in, and I followed that group and things like that. Um, it's rather chaotic. They Since the documentary has aired, they've gotten over 5,000 editions, so they're just trying to kind of figure it out right now. But I actually followed a lot of these groups to try to keep an eye out for cold cases that are going on right now or missing people and things like that. Those are kind of the topics that I'm the most interested in are cold cases or missing people. I also think that, you know, in, in having a true crime book club, and I mentioned this previously, one of the things that is always vital to us is paying homage to the story of the victim. And so, for me, it is important to always get out the story of the victim and to talk about the victim and to talk about what's going on and to keep their spirit alive. I think that that's very, very important and to also be respectful of the victim. Um, so that will be something that I will continue to be doing through my videos as well. And in fact, when I was talking about the Herb Baumeister case, so many of you really complimented me on how respectful I was of talking about the victims, and I, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, I have to be honest with you, whenever I watch a, whether it's a true crime YouTube video covering it, or a documentary, or whatever, and there's not a lot of homage paid towards the victim, um, I'm like instantly turned off and I have really no interest in watching it. Just to be honest with you, um, for me, I think the story of any of these crimes completely it, uh, revolves around the victim. And it's really, truly, to be honest with you, true crime is really about solving the victim's story, not solving the the person that's committing the crime. Um, and that's interesting to me, is to tell the story of the victim. And so I want to continue to do that while I talk about these uh, these different true crime cases. One of the things that I didn't really know how to do, like I said, was how to pick cases. And, you know, do I just, like, go online and go, okay, this is the hottest topic that people are talking about, let's go talk about that. And that felt very inauthentic for me. And I wanted to do this, you know, from a point of view that, like, of me loving it. And how I go in and how do I pick a true crime documentary that I'm going to watch and things like that, right? And so I thought, you know, there's a lot of cases that you guys asked me to talk about, Maura Murray being one of those, that um, I really, to be honest with you, I, I watch true crime pretty closely, and there's some cases that, like, I've heard of, but I didn't really know a lot about, or I haven't watched any documentaries or read any books on. And so, I, um, thought that probably a good place to start with some of these cases that are ongoing, like the Maura Murray case, um, would be to just do kind of, like, a base level, uh, video talking about the history of the case. And there, then if there's any updates that happen, when I come on here, I'll already have kind of a history of talking about that. I'm going to do that with the John Bonet Ramsey case, although I don't think there's going to be any updates that are going to come out anytime soon. I wish, but I don't think that that's going to be the case. I will also continue to follow the Herb Baumeister case because there's actually updates that are going on right now. One of the things that I wanted to do this weekend um, is I wanted to reach out to some people that I know and how to kind of pursue this channel in an appropriate manner. Um, if you watch my Herb Baumeister case, what you know is that um, I have been brought a lot of information. I've been brought a lot of theories about things that were going on behind the scenes. For those of you that don't know, that don't watch my vlog, I have a vlog channel that I post almost every single day. Haven't for the last three days because I took the weekend off. Um, but I post on there almost every single day for 45 minutes to an hour, and I share personal stories of my life, and I just give updates of what I did the last 24 hours and things like that. But if you don't watch that, you might not know that in my previous life, before I was a YouTuber, I have a long history of working with 
um, law enforcement, Department of Corrections, and the justice system in the state of Indiana. And those are relationships that I have built over the last 25 years with uh, law enforcement, probation officers, parole officers, and judges in the state of Indiana. I still have those connections today. Um, and those are people that I am still friends with, that I still talk to with on a regular basis. Many of them no longer work for the Department of Corrections anymore. No, Many of them no longer work for the Justice Department anymore. But many of them, do, or the, the justice system anymore, but many of them do. And, um, and so I wanted to reach out to some of them and kind of how to pursue this. And um, it was also a question that I asked Emily Baker. And what is my um, culpability in having to bring, or what is my responsibility in having to bring information that's brought to me? Um, am I able to get on video and just share a theory that I think I have and things like that? And so um, it was an interesting conversation. And it was funny because um, I talked to two friends of mine that have been probation officers for 30 plus years and a friend of mine that's a parole officer. And in talking to all three of them, they said to me, Peter, I'm kind of surprised that you didn't start this sooner because you've always been obsessed with cold cases. And in fact, way, way, way back in the day when I, I was working and interacting with the Department of Corrections, I can remember that um, I would drive to these sites and I would listen to Patricia Cornwell cases. Um, and or, uh, is that her name, the author? And that was kind of how I got started um, listening to a lot of like cold cases and kind of, you know, being interested in them. And that kind of like segued into a lot of true crime. My, you know, I grew up with both my, my grandmother on my mom's side and my grandfather on my dad's side, you know, being obsessed with true crime. My grandfather was a homicide detective and things like that. I've shared those stories before. I shared it in the Herb Baumeister video. So I've always had an interest in this, and but I just, I wanted to make sure that I was doing it in an appropriate way. There will be times in the future when I'm talking about cases that I will continue to reach out to these people. Um... I have a former judge that I'm very good friends with in the state of Indiana that I reach out to from time to time and ask questions about and things like that. And um, I also have recently been working with a team of investigators and things like that. So there's a lot of people that I can talk to as far as reference. This case necess won't necessarily be one of those cases, but I just wanted to make that clear in case in a video I say something. I also, for those of you that don't know that are finding me for the first time, um, I have been sober for over 29 years and I'm actively involved in a 12-step program. My sobriety birthday is December 17th of 1994. That will probably come into play in a lot of the videos that I talk about that have any kind of hint at addiction or substance issues whatsoever. Um, and, you know, just to put this out there, I have many friends of mine that have served, you know, long prison sentences. And I have, you know, in, in and out of the Department of Corrections and things like that. I have many friends of mine that are sober, that work within the system, and things like that today. So... That being said, I'm kind of surrounded by this all the time. And, um, you know, and a lot of people ask me if I would be willing to cover cases that had happened in Indiana. Um, I'm completely comfortable doing that. In fact, I really kind of, after I, I said it in the video about uh, being scared to talk about the Delphi case, and I, that's why I never had before, it kind of broke the gate and the, the waters flooded after that. I just It seemed like the next three days I was talking to people left and right about the Delphi case. If the Delphi case is something that you guys would like me to talk about, um, I'm more than willing to do that. I have a lot of speculation about the Delphi case. I'm not entirely sure that they have the right person. I'm not entirely sure that there's only one person. Um, I think that it is a very complicated and intricate case that has multiple people that are involved in it. And I think that it is a mass cover-up as well. And that's just one of my theories about it, but I can go into more detail about that. The Delphi case is actually something that I'm pretty well versed in talking about. If you watch my Herb Baumeister case, I think it was pretty obvious that I have followed this case for many, many, many years that I know like all the ins and outs and all the details and all that kind of stuff that he had a void to hell in his bathroom. And I know all the ins and outs and things like that. And and interestingly, that case kind of surrounds me. Um, the house that he grew up in is one block from me, and a house that he used to live in is like three blocks from me. And so it's like right around here. Um, and I feel like it's kind of hard for me not to think about it. Um, people have also asked me if I'm going to continue to cover the Murdoch, uh, if I'm going to cover the Murdoch murder since it's coming out. And I just finished reading Blood on Their Hands by Mandy Matney. Um, I love the book. And I have to tell you, um, if, you, if you're interested in the Murdoch case at all, definitely read Blood on Your Hands. If you're interested in true crime, 100% read Blood on Their Hands by Mandy Matney, who is a podcaster that covered the Murdoch murders. What's so interesting to me about it is this, this book is not getting more attention. It really, to be honest with you, the way that it's told 
reminds me so much of I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And somebody laughed at me the other day in a comment. And they said, Peter, do you realize that every time... I said it in my vlog and they commented. And they said... It was a sweet comment. But they said, do you realize that every time you say the title, you say the whole title? And it's because I love the title of the book. And it's I'll Be Gone in the Dark, One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer uh, by Mich Michelle McNamara. And what I loved about that book and what I felt like really changed the era of true crime writing at that time that she wrote that book and she has since passed. There's also a HBO documentary about that. Um, is that she um, that she intertwined her personal life and her personal story with her hunt for the Golden State Killer. Her personal life and her personal story greatly affects her hunt for the Golden State Killer in a very similar fashion to how Mandy Matney and her personal life and the struggles that she encounters in her career and other places affect how she approaches the murder murders. And it's so interesting and it's so well done. If you're also looking for another uh, true crime documentary or true crime uh, story to follow, Jax Miller, who... Um, Incidentally, came into our True Crime uh, book club and we did a live stream. We got to interact with her and meet with her and she's awesome and I've talked to her and she's just fantastic. She wrote Hell in the Heartland, which is a very, very important story and it's very similar to the Delphi murders. Um, the two victims are still missing and it's still an ongoing case and that will probably be a case that I'll talk about over here because I think it's a case that deserves a lot of attention. So that's kind of the basis at 16, almost 17 minutes of me getting started on this. And like I said, I'm nervous. I'm nervous because I don't want to do this right. I'm nervous because I want to do it from my point of view and just be myself. I actually was like, earlier I was like, I need a catch line. All these true crime people have a catch line. I was like, should I say, let, okay, let's investigate. Let, you know, whatever. And I was like, or maybe I should just say, okay, let's do some true crime and lip gloss because that's kind of true to who I am. So let's get into this. And I will say before I get into this, um, I want to put a trigger warning out there that I'm going to be talking about sensitive topics. And so this might not be the video for you. I just want to make that clear. All of my videos are, are marked, not made, uh, you know, for kids and things like that. But I just want to make this very, very clear that anything that I talk about when it comes to true crime will be of a very sensitive nature. And I just want to put a trigger warning out there ahead of time for that. Okay, so let's get into this. So last week, I put out this video and I also put an Instagram post. And I actually put a follow-up one today asking you guys for topics that you wanted me to talk about. Um, uh, about true crime. And um, I got a lot of different suggestions from things. People put cases I'd never heard of before, which I'm really appreciative of. People put a lot of cases I had heard of. A lot of people put the Murdoch murders. A lot, of, a lot of people put John Benet Ramsey. I did not realize there was that much interest in that case today, which um, is very, very interesting. And I'm thankful that there is because I do deserve, I do believe that John Benet deserves uh, justice. So, um, like I said, that will be a case I'll be following down the road. But a lot of people put Mara Murray. Now, I had heard of Mara Murray through the years. I had heard her talked about in true crime circles and like when we would do the live streams for the book club and things like that, people would reference her. But I didn't know anything about the case. And I have to tell you, one of the things that I love as a lover of true crime and trying to figure these things out, and even though I'm not like doing deep dives, I will say... I am a, like, amateur citizen detective a little bit. Like, I'm kind of, like, trying to figure things out. And I, I said this in previous videos. If you're somebody that's actively a citizen detective or actively a internet sleuth, could you reach out to me in the email listed below? Um, I'm, wanting to, uh, I'm wanting to interview somebody. I was actually going to interview the person that, the woman that was in, um, they called him Mostly Harmless. She's so overwhelmed right now with um, what's going on with her group that I think I'll give her a break. And then I also wanted to maybe interview the woman that was in Don't F With Cats because I just loved her demeanor and I loved her approach and everything about that. There's also somebody in the uh, the book and the documentary I'll Be Gone in the Dark that I wanted to reach out to too because I want to kind of see what people's method is for how they find cases, how they get interested in it, and like what's their personal attachment or personal pull. Because I think any story that we watch, we have a personal attachment to, right? Um, and so I saw a lot of people put Mara Murray. And so I said, okay, well, I will go in and I'll see what I can find about her. And I was looking through this weekend because I was like, I'm going to just watch true crime this weekend. That's, I just want to relax. I'm going to watch true crime all weekend. And so I ended up last night, I watched True Detective. I binge watched the entire uh, season. I've been waiting for six weeks for the finale to come out. Um, which is not true crime, by the way. It was just with Jodie Foster. But I, I started searching and I was like looking up all of these true crime um, documentaries, like the best of true crime and things like that. And, and interestingly enough, I have to tell you, 
I came up with a list, I tried to come up with a list of all of the watched uh, true crime video, true crime shows I've ever seen. And currently I have a list of 82 and I have to say, there's probably about 40 on there that I, I can't remember. Um, so I'm gonna have to go in and I'm gonna have to look closer. But recently, this week, or just this weekend, the ones that I watched were uh, The Dif Disappearance of Mara Murray, The Truth About Jim, and uh, which was about this woman, it's uh, on, I think it's on Peacock, what, or it's either on Peacock or Max, and it was about this woman who thought her step-grandfather was possibly a serial killer, they talked about him possibly being a Zodiac killer, also. everybody, everybody always thinks that if you live on the West Coast, and you were alive during the 70s, and you were uh, shifty and shady, that you could have been a Zodiac killer, so... Um, so there was that I watched out this weekend. It was okay. It kind of got boring a little bit. And then I watched the Pike County Murders, which was actually very, very interesting. It took place in Kentucky, which is very close to me because I'm in Indiana. So I wanted to go in and I saw this come up for the disappearance of Maura Murray. I thought it was a new documentary, but apparently it came out in 2017. Now, like I said, I like to watch a true crime documentary that I know nothing about. Now, what I want to say this first before I get into this. Every true crime that I, uh, case that I talk about from the beginning, two things I've decided that I'm going to do, okay? And, um... My Favorite Murder does it on their podcast sometimes, so I feel like I can do it over here, and I love My Favorite Murder. Um, <clears throat> and that is that they read the Wikipedia page. So I'm going to read the Wikipedia page just to get everybody on the same page. And then I'm also going to give you guys my theory at the end of the video of what I think, okay? Of what I think are possibilities. Because I think, isn't that what we watch True Crime for, to think about what we think is possible? <clears throat> And I was talking to my friend today on the phone, and she's actually watching it because I recommended it to her, but she's followed the case for a long time. She said, what do you think happened? When I told her what I thought happened, which I'd actually run by a friend of mine that um, kind of knows some people with some, like, uh, that this happened to, she, she, was, um, she was like, oh, that's an interesting, because uh, I wanted to run this by, before I said it on video and look like a complete fool, I wanted to run it by a friend of mine and say, does this still happen? Is this possible? And she said, absolutely, 100%. So, um, so I wanted to check with my, my front, my source. <laughs> I have lots of sources, right? So anyway, um, okay. So I wanted to go in here and I wanted to watch this documentary. So I watched the documentary, The Disappearance of Mara Murray. It came out in 2017. There really, to be honest with you, I looked, there haven't been a lot of updates since 2017. There have been a few, and I'm going to read them off the Wikipedia page here in a second. Um, but a, uh, there haven't been tons. There's been tons and tons of speculation. There's been one book that has been written about it by James Renner, who is um, shown a lot in the documentary, The Disappearance of Maura Murray. Now, one thing I do want to say about this true crime book by James Renner, who they kind of like source as like this expert because he's followed the case for so long and stuff like that. As somebody that has had a true crime book club now, I think for four years we've had it. And so... I mean, what, we've read like almost 50 books or something like that at this point. One of the things that you find, especially in today's time, when a case happens, okay, that there is this urgency for a lot of true crime writers to get the, the book out, like, you know, strike while the, the iron's hot kind of thing, right? And so if a lot of people are talking about it and it's at a time when a lot of people are interested in a case, true crime writers will put out a book with really no follow-up whatsoever. For example, we read a very poorly done book about the Delphi murders last year. Three-fourths of the book was about this guy starting his podcast. And the last fourth was about misinformation and all different kinds of suspects that they ended up uh, canceling out these suspects and didn't even really until the... It was like an add-in at the very end of the book about who they had actually um, arrested in the case. And so a lot of, of these true crime writers try to get books out not necessarily to pay homage to the victim or to even pay homage to the investigation of the story, but just to strike while the iron's hot. I really have to be honest with you. I feel like that's a lot of what James Renner did is I felt like he, in watching his interactions and how he was talking about it, there's a pompousness and an arrogance to James Renner and watching him in this documentary that um, I have witnessed also from other true crime writers when they don't really care about the story. They really care mostly about just getting the story out there. They don't care about about the truth, okay? I care about the truth. I care about getting to the bottom of it, all right? 
Um, and I will say this, in the case of Maura Murray, if it isn't in fact true that she left to go find her, you know, start a new life and whatever, then it, it, it you know, poses the question, should we stop asking questions? Should we stop looking for her? Should we stop investigating her? I think one of the reasons why people continue to talk about it is because she is to this day a missing person. And I think people don't believe that she actually started a new life. But I just want to put that out there about true crime um, writers and true crime uh, books. Because in my history of reading them, you either read a book that is very, very well done, that has been researched for years on end, okay, and is put out at the appropriate time, and they don't really care about the timing of it and things like that. And then you have other authors that put out books when it's a hot topic. That is the case with James Warner. He put it out at the time that everybody was talking about Maura Murray. Um, and so I feel like he missed a lot in his investigations. There's a lot of misinformation that he said. There's even things that he said to the woman that was doing the documentary who was fantastic. There was a lot of things that he even said to her that I was like, mm, no, I, that's not true. Like they just, and it was interesting to me because some of the questions that she asked people when other people would tell her, and I think a lot of it had to do with timing of filming, when other people would ask, say the completely opposite thing, she wouldn't counter them. Like it was interesting to me when they interviewed the police, they never asked the police why they didn't. Um, interview her closest sister. That was one of the things that was interesting to me about the documentary was, and this is one of the things that's always interesting to me about watching any true crime documentary is um, why they leave out certain things. Watching True Detective last night with Jodie Foster is interesting because she is a police investigator, a police detective. And one of the things that she says in training these people is, Ask the, ask the question, ask the question, ask the right question. And when they ask the question, she'll say that's not the right question. And looking at true crime often, it's about asking the right question. Are you asking the right question? And that was one of the things that the disappearance of Maura Murray um, talked about was that what is the question? Is the question, where is she? Or the question is, why was she doing what she was doing? And that's the main question is, why did she leave and take off? And to this day, we do not know. So let's get in here and I want to read the Wikipedia page to you guys really quickly. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, just the beginning of it. The disappearance of Maura Murray. Maura Murray, born May 4th, 1982, is an American woman who disappeared on the evening of February 9th, 2004, after a car crash on Route 112 near Woodsville, New Hampshire, a village in the town of Haverville. Haverhill. Her whereabouts will remain unknown. She was a 21-year-old nursing student completing her junior year at the University of Massachusetts Amherst at the time of her disappearance. Now, one thing that's important to note is that she actually served three semesters at West Point, which is a extremely prestigious um, college here in the United States. I also looked into it because of some theories that I have. I was not aware that once you complete West Point, you actually, I think it's following your junior year, so it would be starting your senior year, you basically have to serve a four-year service obligation um, to the U.S. military. I was not aware of that. And then it goes on and talks about her early life. She also had a boyfriend at the time that she went missing. But he was nowhere, because he was had gone to West Point. He was stationed far away, so he was not implicated in it whatsoever because he was not anywhere near where this, when this would have happened. And then it goes on and it talks about updates, and I'm going to give you guys um, some of the updates that have happened since the documentary has come out if you haven't watched the documentary. Um, this is going to stop in just a minute, so give me just one second. Okay, so I want to read you guys the further developments. Um, and I'm assuming that when I'm talking about this, most people know about the case of Maura Murray, just so you know. Um, where is it at? Okay. Do, 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 do. Further development, subsequent searches. Okay, further developments, 2011 to present. This isn't very long. In 2014, on the 10th anniversary of Murray's disappearance, uh, Steltson stated, and this is the police chief, we haven't had any credible sightings of Maura since the night she disappeared. Because there's a lot of people that have said that there are sightings of Maura Murray. Apparently, she was seen in Canada. They kind of debunked that theory in the documentary. In an article published in the New York Daily News on the 10th anniversary of his daughter's disappearance, it was reported that Fred Murray believed she was dead and had been abducted the night of her disappearance. 
On February 9, 2017, the 13th anniversary of Murray's disappearance, Stelson wrote in an email to the Boston Globe, it's still an open case with periods of activity. I have to be careful about reading this Wikipedia. Last time that I read this Wikipedia in my video, you had to confirm whether or not you wanted to watch it or not. Okay. It's still an open case with periods, with periods of activity and at times it goes dormant. There are no updates to share at this time. In February 2019, the 15th anniversary of Murray's disappearance, so this would be everything after this is things that have come out since this documentary. Uh, Fred Murray, her father, reiterated his belief that his daughter was dead, as well as his suspicions about the nearby house that cadaver dogs responded to. So, in this documentary, they found this house, and they tested this wood for blood. It's kind of how the documentary ends. Well, the documentary ends with them going, the podcasters that had done this podcast about it had found these coordinates, okay? And these coordinates led to the middle of this woods that was like a seven-hour hike or something like that, and so they went there, and they found nothing. So then they tested this wood to see there were human DNA on it. It was a male and a female, allegedly, to test it and see if it tested, like, if it matched the DNA of Maura Murray. So that's what he's referring to. Um, as well as his suspicions about the nearby house that cadaver dogs responded to, stating, that's my daughter, I do believe. In early April, excavation was done within the basement of the house. Fred Murray had previously wanted to search the home, but the owners did not cooperate. Following sale of the property, its new owners allowed several searches of the property. However, the excavation conducted in early April found absolutely nothing other than what appears to be a piece of uh, pottery or old piping. In early 2021, the tree at the site where Murray was last seen, which had been marked with a blue ribbon as a memorial, was cut down by the property owner. Shortly thereafter, a request from Murray's family to have a New Hampshire historical marker placed at the site, which had been submitted in late 2020, was turned down by the New Hampshire Division of Historical Resources. On September 14, 2021, New Hampshire State Police announced that bone fragments have been found on Loon Mountain in Lincoln, New Hampshire, approximately 25 miles east of the site of Murray's crash. One of the speculations is that three people that worked at the ski lodge on Loon Mountain were the people that possibly abducted Amara Murray, that they even possibly took her to a party where she could have OD'd at the party and then they got rid of her body. So that's what they're uh, talking about with this right there. They've never been able to identify the three, the three men. And so they've never investigated that, which I think is interesting because in the documentary they say, or maybe they have found out who these three people are and they're just not saying on the Wikipedia page. I haven't listened to every podcast, so I'm sure that there's probably out there. But what's interesting to me about that is in the documentary they say that they aren't able to identify the three men. But then they, this one guy says they never showed up for work. So wouldn't it be easy to go there and say who are the three guys that didn't show up for work the day after Mark Murray's death? I mean, that to me seems like a pretty simple thing to investigate. So, but I'm not a documentarian. Murray had been to the mountain before and had knowledge of the area, according to her sister. The bone fragments were described as pretty small, and it was expected to take at least two months to determine if they were the remains of Murray or not. In November, it was announced that the remains were not of Murray. In January 2022, the FBI issued a national alert in Murray's case and created a violent criminal apprehension profile, allowing multiple law enforcement agencies to share information regarding her case. In July 2022... Law enforcement in New Hampshire initiated a search of the towns of Landeff and Easton. On February 2024, on the 20th anniversary of her disappearance, New Hampshire officials released an age progression photo of Murray. And since then, there really hasn't been anything. Um, it came out that the blood on the wood was not Mara Murray's. I do know that. Um, and that the investigation is going on. Two reasons why I'm talking about this. Number one is because a lot of people ask me to, but second of all is because I was reading articles and her sister, um, I believe her sister Katie, said that she wants more people to talk about this to bring awareness to the case. And so since I didn't know that much about it and I'm an avid true crime watcher, I want anybody out there to be educated into it and look into it and things like that. There's a lot of theories. The theories are either, so this is what happened. So when you watch the documentary, you'll see this. She was at UMass, okay? A week, like two weeks prior to that, she had had a car accident, okay? Now, they kind of paint over this in the documentary. She called her, her, her dad, and there was all this kind of stuff about this car accident. Her dad was very upset because it was her car, or his car that she was driving, supposedly. What has come out since then, allegedly, okay, is that there was a possible hit and run that she was involved in, and that they tried to cover it up possibly with another accident. They don't really address that in the documentary, but that's something that's come out, and in all the message boards and forums and things like that, it's talked about pretty openly, okay, that she was allegedly involved in this hit and run, okay? The other thing that's a huge point is when they interview her older sister, Kathleen, who has since passed away, 
Um, they interview her and they, because there was supposedly this phone call that she received that they believe might have set her into like panic mode and that's why she ran. And on the interview, her sister who reports having substance abuse issues, she says that, um, that she told her sister on the phone that she was drinking again, okay? And that her sister then, like, that was why... Because when she got off this phone call, it's very weird when you read the articles and you watch a documentary because it tells two different stories. Um, but, like, in the, kind of mashing the two together... In the documentary, what they say is that she was at work. She got a phone call from her sister. And when she got off the phone call, she was very distraught. They had to walk her back. What she said was, my sister. And so they thought it was something that her sister had told her. And what her sister told her was that she was drinking again after she had gotten out of treatment. Okay? Which is interesting to me, then, that her go-to is that she buys a ton of alcohol, drives north, buys even more alcohol, okay? Is an intoxicated driving. And... I'm just speculating as a person in recovery and as a person that who's my, my mother got sober six months after me. I don't know that that would have been a go-to for me of being frustrated with, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm just speculating as somebody that's lived there because I think that's what we do with true crime, right? We put ourselves in their shoes. It just is interesting to me that her go-to on being so upset about her sister drinking again after treatment would be to go buy a bunch of alcohol and drive north while she's drinking and driving. Like, that to me is kind of an interesting go-to, and it's a discussion point that was never discussed in the documentary. What they speculate was that the phone call that she received was actually about the accident, and that she was very upset about the accident, okay? And she covered it up by saying, my sister. Now, what is known is that when she was at West Point, she said initially that she transferred to UMass and Amherst because University of Massachusetts because she wanted to pursue nursing, okay? At, when she was at uh, West Point, she was an engineering student, which are kind of two vastly different career paths, right? And when she was at West Point, she was at Fort Knox. This is a huge part of the story. And while she was there, she was in the gift shop. She apparently stole nail polish or some makeup, allegedly, and she was caught. And so this is a huge issue of conduct disorder um, at West Point, which they take very, very seriously. And so she was asked to leave West Point. She was kicked out of West Point. So she went to UMass. That doesn't come out later until the story, right? So she didn't necessarily leave West Point on her own. Now, this is somebody that was running cross-country and track for West Point. She had, like, gotten straight A's in high school. She had run cross-country and track. And then all of a sudden, she gets to West Point, and she steals something. Now, this is interesting to me because it doesn't go along with the pattern of who we know Mara Murray to be, okay? But then all of a sudden, she starts having all these problematic behaviors come out, right? Which paints kind of an interesting picture. So then she goes and she's at UMass. She's having issues with her boyfriend. She hears cheating allegations from him. She apparently gets some email where he confirms that she was cheating on him. And so she does her homework for her nursing class the next day. She boxes up her whole room. What they speculate in the documentary is that possibly she never unpacked at all. But she was there long enough to be doing homework. I think most college students, when they move into the dorm, the first thing they do is unpack. So I think that, that we can kind of maybe throw that idea out there. But then she packs up all of her books and boxes as if she's never coming back. She goes, she withdraws all of her money um, from a ATM. We also find out that along the way, she stops at the police department and she picks up the paperwork from the accident. Okay, now that's interesting to me because I think that that is something that could have set her off, depending on what the paper, paperwork said, okay? She's now got an, she's an expulsion from West Point, okay? She's got a car accident. She has multiple things that, are, that have been going on, right? It looks like she could possibly lose her license for good. Things like that are speculated. And so she's got all this going on in her head. She withdraws all of her money, which is like 200 and some dollars from her bank account. She goes and she buys alcohol and then she drives north to New Hampshire. She has a car accident at supposedly 7.30 at night on this small country road out in the middle of nowhere that has three houses that are looking on it. And then she vanishes into thin air, okay? I mean, literally, they have no idea where she went. There were no footprints off the road into the snow. Uh, the, tra the tracking dogs go halfway down the road. And it's literally as if she got into a car and she drove away, okay? So there are several different theories. The theories are that somebody picked her up and abducted her and did harm to her. The other theory is that she walked off into the woods and she's no longer with us. And, the, and that that was intentional or it was not intentional. And the other theory is that she 
went up there with the intention of going to Canada, crossing the border, and inventing her new life, okay, to escape all this. That she was escaping the men in her life is what James Renner, the author, said, indicating her father, who he comes out and indicates that he was abusive, which there's absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, and then he also says that um, she was escaping her boyfriend. Well, her boyfriend was literally hours away, and emailed her that he was cheating with her. It didn't, to be, in, in all honesty, and not to be rude to the story, but it didn't seem to me like he was really fighting to stay with her that hard. So I'm not really sure that that seems like that is accurate to me. Do I think that she had all this stuff that was piling up around her and she used to be this person that was very direct and great grades and very driven when it came to sports and athletics and was at West Point and then had this problem at West Point, then went to Amherst or Mass University of Massachusetts at Amherst, then had more problems there, then had relationship problems. It was all piling up and she thought to herself, like, what if I'm lost? And then at that point, decided I'm just going to take off. Yes, I think that that's actually a probable possibility. I actually think there's another possibility as well. But I want to go through my notes before I get into deeper this because I took a lot of notes, okay, on this whole story. So let me get into my notes. Um, I want to go through plausible scenarios, all right? And I want to talk about the plausible scenarios. One plausible scenario is that the sister is hiding something, the sister Kathleen, because when they interview her, this person that's looking at it says she's being so genuine. I didn't get that take on her. And that's just, you know, listen, I, I think I have a pretty good judge of people. I felt like she was hiding something. But here's the thing. The sister could have been hiding something. I believe the family has secrets that have never come out. I do believe that. The sister could have been hiding something. And that was what people are reading into, but it might not have had anything to do with the disappearance of Maura. Um, it might not have had anything to do with where she was or what she knew about that or anything like that. Um, her sister was obviously a very troubled person as well, and I, I feel for her. Um, and I think that they were probably, you know, unrelated. Um, so, and then I said something about this. Okay, the driving in tandem. This is interesting that they never discuss this in the documentary. To insinuate, so they insinuate that she was driving in tandem with somebody. There's at one point insinuating that it was three other girls or two other girls that came up there with her in a car behind her, and they were the ones that picked her up. At one point, there was something about a guy smoking a cigarette in a car, and that he could have followed up her, and who was this guy, and blah, blah, blah. Was he a guy that she saw? Because there was a party that happened right before she left Amherst, like days before. And was it a going away party? That's what James Renner suggested, okay? And all this kind of stuff. What's interesting to me about that is that packing up her, all, her stuff, and they say in there that that doesn't go along with her not wanting to be here anymore on this planet, um, and her packing up all of her boxes, her doing her homework, her having a go-away party, her traveling somewhere that is comfortable and safe to her, that actually does go along with all that ideation. It actually does. It kind of fits that, in all honesty. I was kind of surprised in the documentary that they steered away from that and they just kind of ruled it out as a possibility. I'm not entirely sure that I would. Um, a lot of her behaviors, having had friends that were, behaved very similar about having a party, if it was a going away party or a celebration or whatever it was, Amara, and her doing her homework, her acting as if everything is fine, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, that saying goodbye to people, all that kind of stuff, that is consistent with what a lot of people do. So I'm not entirely sure about that. But what's interesting to me about this, and they never discuss this in the documentary, and I'm sure this has been discussed elsewhere. I mean, I saw it in some articles, but for to insinuate that she rode in tandem with somebody means that the auto accident was pre-planned, okay? That it wasn't just this thing where she was on this country road. And, and why, if she was riding in tandem, was she on this country road? Why wouldn't they just take the interstate all the way north to Canada? It doesn't really make sense that she would go off on this side road in the middle of nowhere, New Hampshire. She has this car, a this car accident, and then they supposedly, whoever's riding in tandem with her behind her, picks her up. That would insinuate that the car accident was planned before she even left, okay? And I'm not entirely sure that I can buy that story. The one thing that is interesting to me is that when they search inside her car, they find alcohol. But there's alcohol on the roof. There's alcohol on the door. It almost looks as if they threw alcohol around to make it seem like she was drinking. The other thing that's interesting they don't ask is that when they interview the bus driver originally, and they show this on TV, he said she didn't appear drunk. She didn't seem like she was okay. She seemed wrong. The police investigator says, 
that when he interviewed the bus driver, the bus driver's the guy that stops and says, do you need a ride? And she says, no, I'm, I'm fine, right? I've already called, I've called 911. When she hadn't called 911 and he knew that because there was no cell service out there. Why nobody asked the bus driver, why didn't you push her on there and say there's no cell service out here? There's no way you could have called 911 and he just went home. It's interesting to me. That story is speculative to me, but he's since passed on, so we'll never know. Um... But what's interesting to me is that in the interview, and they show the interview, he said she wasn't drunk or whatever. The police investigator that interviewed him said that the bus driver told him that she was drunk. But the documentarian never questions the police on this. I think that's a pretty pivotal point, whether she was intoxicated or whether she wasn't. He also goes on to say there was a lot of alcohol poured around her car. It almost seemed to me like it was staged. It felt very staged to me. So, you know, that was interesting to me is why would you stage it to look like you were drinking in this car? Was it then that you were so drunk you drove into this tree, there wasn't much damage to the car, and then you just woke? That would almost insinuate that she was leaving and having somebody pick her up to just go off on somewhere else, right? So I'm not entirely sure about the tandem driving thing because that would insinuate if they were going to pick her up there that the car accident had to be planned ahead of time and how they would pick this random road out in the middle of nowhere with a tree that they didn't even know existed to do that is weird for me, right? You know, I don't know. Um, I, I do think it's interesting that she could be worried if she was drinking that she was going to get a DUI. She, we, we do not know what the paperwork says from the police station that she was picked that she had just picked up that day. If it insinuated that she was in more trouble than she knew at the time, and then she thought she was going to get a DUI from this accident, it is possible that maybe she was just worried that she was going to not be able to get her nursing license and not, and you know, it was uh, yet another thing that had happened to her after just having this most recent car accident. And she was very, very worried about that and that some random person picked her off the road and something happened. I am somebody that is always kind of like, the most realistic thing is probably something that happened. When they said in there that maybe these three guys picked her up because that was the route they would take to the, the mountain and that they went to a party and that she OD'd and then they just got rid of the body, that almost kind of makes sense to me a lot. Like, that is something that is plausible that could happen. The fact that a serial killer just happened to drive by at the exact moment of the 20 minutes or 7 minutes that she was standing out there, picked her up and did harm to her, that seems like a stretch to me. I, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it kind of doesn't seem very plausible to me. Um, and then it goes on, her dad saying that when they ask her, him all these questions, he says, we're wasting time by going down different avenues. And I completely agree with that. You know, you have to follow the evidence of the story of the victim, right? This is a girl who was lost and was getting in constant trouble. This is not who she was before. She had become somebody new. It was very obvious that she had a lot of issues. I don't know what she was struggling with in her personal life. I don't know that we'll ever know that, you know? A lot of people have speculated, was it this? Was it that? Blah, blah, blah. She was obviously dealing with something, and substances were a part of that, you know? And she was dealing with that in different ways. Or maybe she, that had always been who she was, but I don't believe that. It's so contradictory to who she was when she was in high school and who she was when she started at West Point. Something happened in her early years at West Point that led to the, the shoplifting and that led to the accidents and the drinking and all this kind of stuff. Something occurred in the life of Mara Murray that I don't think that we know, but I do believe that maybe her family knows and have never come out and talked about whether it's because of shame and guilt. But I have to believe that maybe part of that story would lead to understanding the truth about what happened because, again, it takes us back to the question of why did she leave? Um, then it goes in, and a lot of people speculate that the police possibly were involved in that, that they did harm to her or whatever. I'm not entirely sure that maybe... Okay, there's another theory, but I'll get to that in just a second. Because they say that this woman drove by, this is witness A, and that she saw SUV 001, and that was the police chief's car. It later comes out that the, the police investigator that was the first person to show up at the accident was driving that, that the police chief was never there, is what they, is what they allege, okay? Um, and the state trooper, Monahan, he never filed a report. I think one of the things, and the police officer actually, the police chief actually brings this up, and I think this is an interesting point of view, is that when they went out there initially, how does he say it? Because I haven't written down exactly how he says it. I thought that this was interesting. He says, we weren't responding to the largest missing persons case in the state of New Hampshire's history. We were responding to a car accident. Because there's a lot of people saying that the police were negligent at the time they did this investigation, right? <clears throat> 
but they were just responding to an accident. They actually say over and over and over in the, in the, and I've seen this in articles as well, that at the time of a lot of accidents, especially on rural roads and stuff like that, people flee because maybe they were drinking and driving because of this, because of that. Maybe they, they left the scene because of whatever reason, but that's a common thing. And so for them, they were just responding to an accident. They did not know this was going to turn into the big, biggest missing persons case in the history of New Hampshire. At that time, they had no idea of that. So we're looking at speculation of, on hindsight of 2020, right? A lot of what we're speculating is having the knowledge that we have now looking back on 2020 when plausibility could have been a very simple story at that time, right? And you have to lead with what the facts and the evidence tell us. Um, they find in the car five packs of sleeping pills, but one pack of missing sleeping pills, which is interesting to me because they're like over-the-counter sleeping pills. I'm not entirely sure, and there's not any missing alcohol from the car. I don't think that one pack of sleeping pills, unless her plan was to go out in the world, into the woods, take these sleeping pills, and fall asleep in the woods, which is what her family actually insinuates at the beginning, they tell the police investigators, unless that was the case. I don't know, well, you know, it just that part to me is very, very interesting. Um, then they bring up this theory about Israel Keys. Okay, and this is interesting because every unsolved case in the United States, they always throw out Israel Keys' name. If it's on the West Coast, it's always the Zodiac, uh, the Zodiac uh, Killer. If it's anywhere else in the United States, they throw out Israel Keys. We actually read in our True Crime Book Club the book American Predator, which is about Israel Keys. It's extremely intensive researched book about him. It has the FBI files in there, the investigations that they did, the interviews that they did with him and things like that. And one of the reasons why Israel Keyes, who was a renowned serial killer, he's known as the first bionic serial killer because he was doing things like having gastric bypass surgery and things like that so that he could go for days on end without eating while he was on the hunt for people. He was trying to get his fingerprints removed in Mexico. He had had all these different things that he was doing to become like the bionic uh, serial killer is really what he has, his aim was. He had a child, and one of the reasons why he was willing to release or exchange information with the FBI was so that they would um, not take the death penalty off because he, he wanted the death penalty. He, he wanted to die, and he didn't want his child to have to grow up with all this being known about him. So he released a lot of information. What's interesting about it is that during the investigation, they threw out several cases. And he'd say, no, I don't know anything about that. No, I don't know anything about that. That one I do know, which is a case in Indiana that I'm going to get to and I'm going to talk about because it's still an open case. It's a very serious case that happened at Indiana University. It's actually a case that when they throw down her picture, he says, that's, a, that's something you're going to have to ask me about later. What's interesting about this, though, is that any unsolved case in the United States, especially ones that have to do with young missing girls, they always throw out Israel Keyes' name, okay? What's interesting about Israel Keyes is that he buried these kill kits all over the United States, if you know anything about his story. And he was very specific about, he wasn't just standing on the side of the road waiting for somebody to show up. It, that wasn't his MO. And so for them to even insinuate in this, I think that is again where the father is saying, you're, like, this is, we're, we're going down an avenue that doesn't need to be gone down. We need to focus on the evidence. We need to focus on the story at hand, okay? Of what's going on. Um... Uh, I watched a show, I said uh, all this kind of stuff, and so, you know, what? one of the things I kept thinking about while I was watching this, and I actually looked online to see if there was any theories about this, I, I, I couldn't find any, I want to see where I'm at on time, hold on a second, I couldn't really see theories about this, but one of the things that kept on coming up for me was, I remember the movie Zero Dark Thirty, and Zero Dark Thirty, if you know, was Jessica Chastain, okay, was a special ops person, um, and she was recruited at a high school. The movie got a lot of criticism at that time because they said that the CIA was not recruiting people out of high school, which then they did this whole cleanup thing, and the CIA started this program where they actually did internships for high school students that were interested in going to the CIA. They did this whole cover-up, okay? Well, I actually have had friends of mine being somebody that's in recovery, that's, you know, been around addiction for 29 years now, longer than that. And um, I have a lot of friends of mine that, like I said, you know, work for uh, law enforcement, Department of Corrections, Justice, things like that, that have insinuated through the years that people that are very, very smart, very, very athletic, okay, and, and, and have a kind of non-recognizable 
face or appearance to them, which is interesting because at one point in the documentary, when they're showing a picture of Maura Murray, this one guy says she could be anybody. Like, this could literally be anybody, right? Is when they're showing her face. Like, she looks like anybody. And I was thinking about this movie while I was watching it. I don't know why, right? That here all of a sudden you have this person that went to West Point, okay? Then went left West Point for stealing this nail polish, which is crazy because it doesn't really go along with who she was at the time. It's almost like she was trying to get kicked out of West Point, okay? And one of the things when I was looking into it is that you have to serve the military for four years, some people longer than that, after being at West Point. I'm not entirely sure that wasn't why she was trying to get out, kicked out of West Point instead of just transferring out of West Point. It's interesting to me that she went to West Point, okay, which is a highly, I mean, it's one of the best programs in our country, okay? It's so hard to get into. People, like, just, I mean, it's, like, at the top. I mean, talk about Ivy League schools, right? And then it's also a, a school that's, obviously highly affiliated with the military, okay? She was extremely academic. She ran track and cross-country for West Point. Then she gets this, uh, steals this makeup from the, at Fort Knox. I mean, it's almost kind of like, I want to tell the story that I stole some of the Fort Knox or prove that I could. She gets caught. She gets kicked out of West Point. She then goes into nursing. And I'm sitting here thinking about Zero Dark Thirty, and I'm like, is there a possibility that if somebody did pick her up on the side of the road or this police chief was there, that it wasn't a transport and that she wasn't doing this. I'm just throwing this out there because I have not heard anybody talk about it and it was just something that came up, okay? It's probably a ridiculous theory. But is there a possibility that this very smart, very athletic person that had not been problematic and all of a sudden turned into it? Because I've heard that case happen with people, right? That it's like, if you want to get out of all of this, this is what you're going to do. And she was recruited and that was her way out of it, you know? The only thing that doesn't hit right for that with me is that the family, if they knew anything about it, I do know people that are in this work for the CIA and the FBI, and they many of them have, you know, husbands and wives and children and live at home, and many of their partners, they work for the FBI and the CIA. They just don't know what they do for it many times, right? But what's interesting to me about that, unless she was like a secret, uh, you know, special ops or whatever, that why the family wouldn't know, unless the family does know, you know? Um, but then why keep the story alive that somebody eventually would spot Mara Murray? So it doesn't feel like the family would know. But what may... <laughs> I just don't see that based on what she had, there was this allegation that possibly she was pregnant. That was found that that's not to be true. Her sister says that wasn't true. There were birth control pills found in the car. So what would make her run? What would make her leave, right? And want to start a new life? Unless she was running from something or towards something. But until we know why she left, which we still don't know to this day, we will never know what happened to Mara Murray. But I'm going to continue to talk about this case because I think it's important. I'm just throwing that out there as one speculation. I'll tell you what I really believe happened. I really believe that... I really believe the theory that three men picked her up. She was already like, I, I'm screwed. I, don't, I think she was going somewhere to just get away and whatever. And get away from her problems for a while and think things through. And have some peace and serenity for a little bit. These guys picked her up. They went and partied. And I do think something probably happened to her and they got rid of the body. I, I, most plausible cases sometimes to me make the most sense. Especially when you watch a lot of true crime documentaries. You follow a lot of true crime stories. You read a lot of true crime books. What you find out is except for in extreme cases that the most plausible order is typically what's at hand, unless this is one of those most extreme cases. And there is a feeling that this has elements of that to me. So let me know what you think in the comment section below. Let's keep the story of Mara Murray alive. And hopefully one day this case will be closed. I love you guys. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.